This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with Seed Magazine editor-at-large, Jonah Lehrer, author of How We Decide. Jonah Lehrer is Seed Magazine's editor-at-large, the blogger behind Frontal Cortex at scienceblogs.com, and a contributor to PRI's Radio Lab. He was last here to discuss his book, Proust Was a Neuroscientist, but he's got a new one out called How We Decide. Jonah, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for having me. I can't help but go straight to the back of your book, the acknowledgments, where you talk about the genesis of How We Decide being springing from a decision you were failing to make about what Cheerios to buy. What was the situation there? Not exactly the most consequential decision I've ever made, um, but 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 it happened to me all the time. This is this this is basically my pathological indecision. It's not uncommon for me to spend ten, fifteen, twenty minutes choosing between honey nut Cheerios, multigrain Cheerios, apple cinnamon Cheerios, and you got all the generic Cheerios. Um, and and you know, and so at a certain point, I realized that I was wasting way too much of my morning trying to figure out which cereals to buy in the supermarket aisle. You know, it was that very basic failure that first got me interested in the subject of decision making, so I could figure out what was happening in my head and and what should be happening in my head. So, when you were in these early situations, early by which I mean before writing this book, before doing the research, you would have the subjective experience of not being able to make a decision. And before you knew everything you knew, now what did that feel like? Was what, what did it feel like was going on in your head? It felt very frustrating, and this wasn't just cereal. You know, I mean. I, I would spend 10 minutes choosing between floss. I mean, why are there 100 different types of floss? It's, you know, it's thread. Um, and, and yet, leave it to, you know, American capitalism to give us 100 different types of floss. So, so this would happen to me buying floss, toothpaste, laundry detergent, cereal. And in each case, what I would do is, is I would come up with all sorts of very rational, articulate-sounding reasons why I should buy the Honey Nut Cheerios instead of the multigrain. And then I'd no sooner reach for the Honey Nut Cheerios than I'd come up with all sorts of reasons why I should buy the multigrain instead of the Honey Nut and so on. Um, and, you know, minutes would elapse, 10, 15 minutes. And I'd come up with all these reasons. I'd confabulate all these reasons why I should choose one cereal over the other or why I should buy this toothpaste over the other. And then I could reverse the reasons. So it, it really was a textbook example of thinking too much, what scientists call paralysis by analysis. I'm sure this is a situation that's going to be familiar to most people listening. We've all had a struggle with a decision. But was it like, could you say that you, no matter what, you could think up a reason to favor one over the other, so that could just go on until infinity, because the inventiveness was, was infinite. Was, you had a faculty in your mind to come up with evidence for both sides, but not to cap it off. Exactly. The brain is very good at generating reasons. And the problem with these reasons is that unless, unless they're kind of capped off, as you put it, by this emotional impulse, by an emotional signal telling us, just shut up already and choose a Honey Nut Cheerios, we can come up with reasons all day long. I, I talk in the book about some patients uh, first, first studied by neurologist Antonio Damasio, who's now at USC, and, and he studied these people because, they'd lost all, because, because of some brain tumor, typically. They'd lost the ability to experience any emotion. So they, they couldn't feel fear or pleasure. All these signals we take for granted, they couldn't experience. And you'd think if, if you were a philosopher or an economist, you think these people who didn't experience any emotion, you think they'd be perfectly rational, they'd make the best decisions possible, right? Because their emotions wouldn't lead them astray. Instead, what you find is that these people became like me in the cereal aisle. They became pathologically indecisive. They would spend all day trying to figure out where to eat lunch. They would spend five hours choosing between a blue pen or a black pen or a red pen. When you're cut off from your emotional brain, when you're not able to access those emotional signals, often very subtle signals telling you to choose the Honey Nut Cheerios or the Crest Toothpaste or just to move on already, then you, know, then you can spend all day choosing, choosing a breakfast cereal. So after standing there and failing to get the right emotional impulse to help you make this decision, where did you go from there that was the path that took you to writing a whole book on the subject? Well, I, I, I first just got interested in the subject and started reading books on decision-making, you know, peer-reviewed science papers. And that's when I discovered the work of people like Damasio uh, and, and really got interested in, in, this, in this emerging field. It's only in the last couple of years that I think scientists have really been able to study 
the decision-making process at work in the brain. This is thanks to tools like brain scans and multiple electrode recording where you actually record from individual neurons in the monkey brain. So, so, so these cutting-edge techniques, I think, have given us new insight into what's, ap what's actually happening inside our brain when we make a decision. So, you know, for the first time, we can actually look, look inside. We no longer have to just generate theories from the outside. Um, so I think that that's given us a whole new way of trying to understand the decision-making process. And I, and I was absolutely fascinated by a lot of this research. How recent are these developments that allow, that, that open up the science of decision-making, specifically that branch of neuroscience? Is this within like the last five years or the last 10? Well, brain scans have been around for about the last 12 years. Um, I, I think they've really exploded in the last five years. But I think decision-making science, um, this goes by many names, decision-making science, neuroeconomics. Um, it's often, you know, just, just seen as a branch of neuroscience. I think that's really exploded, I'd say, the last two to three years, where I think a lot of different fields have come together, where they've imported experimental protocols from experimental economics. They've merged with branches of computer science. So, so it's all these different fields coming together with different ways of looking at how we choose a breakfast cereal. Um, you know, all these very powerful approaches, I think, have really helped break open the black box. Before we get a little too far into what findings you talk about in the book, what this new technology has given us in terms of understanding the brain, let's talk a little bit about what this technology and the findings from it has displaced. What's the old way? Now, of course, the image in the book is the, the charioteer with the, with the wild horse and the tamed horse representing your civilized brain. And I forget the, speci the specific terminology, but the civilized brain and the, the kind of unruly one. What, what was the deal there with that old mindset? The old way people had of thinking about decision making was they simply thought about it. They simply generated theories and then, you know, seemed that the th theories were a good fit. And so I think one of the oldest theories, and certainly the most influential theory of decision-making, goes all the way back to Plato, and he imagined the mind as a chariot. And so you had the rational rider, the rational charioteer, and his job was to control the wild, unruly, emotional horses. So he had these reins that allowed him to direct the, you know, to control these emotions and make sure they didn't get out of control. So bad decisions happened, according to Plato, when these horses ran loose, and, and the rational rider didn't do his job. The, the elegance of this metaphor, at least for Plato, and then was kind of reinvented by Freud and went on to influence cognitive science and, 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 and become one of the essential assumptions of modern economics, is that the, the, the job of reason is to control our emotions, that our emotions are bad things. They're bad animal impulses. They're these feelings we share with you know, rats and monkeys. And, and, and what makes humans unique, the, the defining feature of human nature is rationality. And so we always have to exercise our reason and make sure our horses don't run wild. So that really was the governing metaphor of human nature and certainly of decision-making for, I'd say, you know, from the ancient Greeks up until about the late 1990s. And it's only, it's only in very, you know, very recently, in recent years, that we've actually been able to kind of turn that metaphor on its head. And I think, you know, one of the popular new metaphors among scientists is that the emotional brain, those aren't horses. That's actually an elephant. And the rider isn't controlling the horses. He's trying to control an elephant. You know, so I think we no longer see our job as being rational riders. The elephant tends to dictate where we go. The metaphor has definitely changed radically in the last few years. Now, what sort of findings initially chipped away at this old idea of the rational brain controlling the unruly, sort of wicked emotions. What specific kind of data was it that made people, scientists specifically, start thinking, wait, you know, that might not be correct? Well, I think Damasio's work, this work on people who couldn't experience any emotion, was certainly very influential for a lot of people in terms of suggesting that our emotions weren't simply bad things that led us astray, but were actually a crucial component of everyday thinking and cognition. So I think that was very, very groundbreaking research. I think another big influential source of the research came from work on dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter behind many of your emotions. Um, and for a long time, I think people saw dopamine as simply, you know, it was the neurotransmitter of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was responsible for generating the feelings of pleasure that too often led us astray. And, and that really was, I think, the model of dopamine, and that fit very neatly into the old platonic metaphor, you know, our emotions and dopamine, these are things that encode rewards that we shouldn't indulge in, stuff like chocolate cake and, and crack cocaine and stuff like that. And I think it's only in the last, I'd say, 10 years that people have really gotten a good grasp 
on how our dopamine system actually works. And it turns out it doesn't just encode sex drugs in rock and roll. It's actually a crucial, essential component of learning and thinking. It's what allows you to find patterns in the world, parse the world into causation and correlation, and really make sense of everyday reality. Um, and, and, and this really takes place in the emotional brain. So I think the new understanding of the emotional brain is that it's really, in a sense, the internal supercomputer, that, that it's always taking in far more information than you're actually aware of, processing it unconsciously, and then generating emotions as data, as it's known. So, so each emotion is actually a representation of what's happening inside your brain, of all these facts you're not actually paying attention to, but that your brain is, not, is, is, is nonetheless taking into account. I want to get absolutely clear on the subjective experience of the dopamine system in action, just for the listener, and for myself as well, because uh, being definitely not a neuroscientist, I can use all the help I can get. Now, when, when your dopamine system is giving you the emotional cue to go ahead with something, is that like the feeling you, you get where it's, you're eating, I don't know, chocolate or something, where one might be eating chocolate, and you get the feeling where it's like, yes, do more of that. <laughs> yes. Well, well, dopamine, when it's generating pleasure, that's very much what it's trying to do, is do more of that, eat more chocolate, take more drugs, whatever. But dopamine doesn't just encode these very pleasurable feelings. It can also encode feelings like regret. It can also encode feelings like don't do that. It can also encode feelings like fear, stay away from that. So, so it can really encode a, a vast range of feelings depending on the context. So it's not simply the neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter of hedonism. It can also be the neurotransmitter of regret and, 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 and the full range of emotion. It all depends on what exactly it's representing. So if we picture, for example, a psychologist with a rat in a box or something with an elaborate mechanism by which he rewards the rat for certain actions and punishes them with a zap or what have you for other actions, trying to train the rat to do certain things... Our dopamine system could maybe be seen as a natural internal version of what that psychologist is doing to the rat? That's an interesting way to put it. Um, <laughs> kind of off the cuff, but I guess they're, the psychologist is trying to influence the rat's dopamine system, right? Yeah. Well, what the dopamine system allows you to do is find all the patterns that encode rewards. So I think one of the much of what we know about the dopamine system has come from the really groundbreaking work of a scientist named Wolfram Schultz at Cambridge University. And his experiments observe a fairly simple protocol. What he does is he monitors individual dopamine neurons in the midbrain of the monkey, and he gives monkeys squirts of juice. And what he finds is if you give a monkey a squirt of juice, at first it's dopamine neurons fire, right? This is, this is a rewarding squirt of juice, and the dopamine's fire, and it, you know, it sends on a signal saying, oh, how pleasurable, a, a nice squirt of apple juice. That's nice. But then if you keep on giving these monkey squirts of juice, and this doesn't take very long, the dopamine neurons adapt to the reward. They stop firing whenever you fire apple juice, right? This helps explain why, you know, the first bite of chocolate cake is really good, but the fifth bite of chocolate cake, you know, is a little, is a little less thrilling. It's the same reason, you know, your iPod makes you really happy the first day you get it, and then after a week, it's just another thing. Um, so we adapt to rewards. It's just the way the brain is built. However, Schultz discovered something very, very interesting. If you play a bell before giving the monkey a squirt of juice, these neurons will now fire whenever you play the bell, whenever you ring the bell. And if you flash a light before ringing a bell, the neurons will fire whenever you flash the light. And if you play a song before flashing the light, before ringing a bell, and so on, they'll fire at the first event that predicts the apple juice. So, so these cells are known as prediction neurons, and what they're constantly trying to do is to find the first possible event that predicts the eventual reward. So they're constructing these very elaborate patterns and chains of causation that allow you to actually predict and make sense of what will happen next. So, so they're not just about chocolate cake or squirts of juice. They're actually a really crucial component of how we make sense of the world, how we make predictions about what will happen next. And, 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 you know, so I think that's really a good example of how our emotional brain, which is stuffed full of these dopamine neurons, how it's not just these kind of random impulses. It's not just horses running wild. It actually reflects an astonishing amount of computation. It's just computation we're not aware of. If the dopamine system and the emotions that we experience subjectively as a result of it, if they're 
So, I mean, they, they seem so useful and helpful when you put it like that. How did they come to acquire such a bad rap before science was able to get into the, to get into this, the actual workings of it on a micro level? Why did emotions come to be seen as bad things that mislead you? Yeah, it's a very good historical question. Um, I think it's certainly because our emotions sometimes mislead us. Um, you know, as I talk in the book, our emotions aren't a universal solution. We shouldn't simply blink and trust our gut. Um, Sometimes our emotions are very wise and prophetic, and sometimes they're absolutely idiotic. Sometimes they lead us completely astray. And the key is knowing, you know, what are these hardwired flaws in our emotional brain? What aren't our emotions good at, and what are they good at? So, so I, I talk a lot about these emotional flaws, um, and, you know, I think that's probably why Plato was so hard on our emotional brain, because our emotions also lead us to, you know, have too much sex and do too many drugs and listen to rock and roll. So they can also lead us astray. Um, but I think they did get a bad rap in the sense that for a long time we just thought they were these bad impulses, that they were you know, just these animal passions. And I think now we can see that our emotions often reflect a lot of analysis um, and, that they, you know, and that they reflect the computational powers of the unconscious. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we should always just automatically listen to them. And so despite all of the calculation, all the analysis that emotions do in their own way, what is it that leads them to maybe make not the greatest recommendations to us and gives them that bad rap? Well, well this, this, this gets back to evolution, that, that the emotional brain has been worked over by evolution for a long, long time. Um, so, so, so in a sense, it's, you know, it's a perfect example of evolutionary engineering in the sense that it's developed all these habits that may have been very useful a million years ago. They may have been very useful in the Pleistocene era, back when we were, you know, chasing woolly mammoths. But now in modern life, they might not be so useful. So look at something like loss aversion. This is a very well-studied problem, the emotional brain. Uh, that economy, It was first identified by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Fersky back in the late 70s. And loss aversion essentially means that the brain is very sensitive to losses. We're irrationally sensitive to losses. We, we feel the pain of a loss much more strongly than we feel the benefit of a gain, the pleasure of a gain. And so this leads us to do all sorts of foolish things. Like, for example, I talk in the book about how when people evaluate their stock portfolios, they're most likely to sell stocks that have gone up in value because losses feel so bad to us. Losses, on average, feel about twice as bad as gains feel good that we don't want to sell stocks that have gone down in value because that makes the loss tangible. So we end up holding on to losing stocks and selling stocks that are going up. The end result, of course, is that we're stuck with a stock portfolio composed entirely of losing stocks. And that's why, according to several studies, the stocks people sell outperform the stocks they hold on to by about three and a half percent. You know, that's that's not a minor thing. Three and a half percent is a lot of money for most people. Three and a half percent per year. So so that's a great example of an instinct which may have been useful. It may have been useful to be very sensitive to losses way back when. But when you're trying to figure out which stocks to buy and sell, it's not useful at all. It's a terrible thing. So so the emotional brain is stuff full of habits like that that once upon a time were good and, and it just now aren't so good. Um, another example I give in the book is how the emotional brain responds to random systems. So, for example, things like slot machines, your dopamine system, and, and the reason people so often struggle with slot machine addiction, and, and, and I profile uh, a very sad story of a woman who lost everything um, when she was put on a dopamine agonist. That's a drug that, that increases the amount of dopamine in your brain. Um, and, and she lost everything to slot machine addiction. And the reason the dopamine system finds slot machines so alluring, the reason we like losing money to these one-armed bandits, is because random systems short-circuit, in a sense, our dopamine system. They don't, it, it doesn't know how to deal with such random rewards. And so the end result is we're transfixed. So that's another example. And, of course, the stock market is another random walk. It's another random system. So the brain is always fooled by randomness. Unless you know about these situations, unless you know about things like loss aversion and, and the way randomness short circuits our dopamine cells, you're bound to fall victim to these flaws. They're, they're hardwired. Everyone makes these same mistakes. The only way to not make the mistakes is to think before you do it. One of the main thrusts of your book for my reading is, is, yeah, is that we can, with this information that science has found for us, we can make decisions better. But what I wonder is, to what extent do we know that we can... Actually, this is going to get a little meta sounding, but to what extent can we employ information about our own brains? How, can, how much can we think about our own brains? It kind of sounds like biting your own teeth when you say it like that. 
Uh, well, well, I think I think the, the the few studies that have looked at whether or not metacognition, which is thinking about thinking, whether or not you know reflecting on things like loss aversion can actually prevent loss aversion, the few studies have actually found that that the effects can be pretty powerful. That once you make people aware of these flaws and teach them a bit about how to think about their their thought process, they can absolutely learn to not fall victim to these same biases. So, for example, something like cognitive behavioral therapy, that's a form of talk therapy that tries to make, in certain contexts, people aware of these innate biases. That has shown, people have shown that people undergoing cognitive behavioral therapy are less vulnerable to these same biases as the rest of us. So, so I think there is good evidence that metacognition and thinking by thinking can actually improve your thought process. The, 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 the basic prescription is that we've got all these different ways of thinking, um, all these different tools stuffed inside our head. And the key is to learn which situations most benefit from which types of thought. So, so how we think should depend on what we're thinking about. That's, that's the very basic idea, um, I think, behind the book. And, and you know, if you talk to a lot of these scientists, that's what they'd recommend, too, is, is you know, simply this idea which goes all the way back to Plato, that there's some universal solution to the problem of decision-making, that we should always be rational or always trust our gut. That old paradigm, I think, very much misrepresents the way the brain is actually designed. I want to go back a little bit to the earlier portion of your book where you describe how people who are very good at something end up getting there and how they perceive the actual actions of doing things well that they do. You talk about Tom Brady, the football player. You talk about uh, the pilots on the uh, Sioux City crash in the late 80s. Now, how do you frame this? How do you frame this idea of accumulated experience being translated into emotion and that being the most effective way for the brain to get data to the u- user, I guess. We could say user of a brain. Well, I think, you know, one of the conventional assumptions about experts, and we talk about Tom Brady and, you know, I, I talk to a, I mean, everyone from a soap opera director to a, you know, one of the world's great backgammon players. When you talk about these kinds of experts, I think the conventional assumption is that these experts, what makes them experts, is they've got is a, they've got all this explicit knowledge, you know, stored in their head. And when they make a decision, they simply access all this knowledge, all these facts that they have accumulated over time, and and that's how they make a decision. What you actually find is that experts are profoundly intuitive. That experts are actually much more intuitive than novices. You know, I as I quote uh, Gary Kasparov, the the great chess player. You know, when someone asks him, how do you make decisions when playing chess? He says, by smell, by feel. Um, and in the same way, when you ask a quarterback how they find the open man, how they make a decision over where to pass the ball, what they'll often say is, I don't know how I made the decision. He just felt like the open man. Um, he just felt like that's where I should throw the ball. And so I think that's a consistent theme of expertise. Is, is, is that what allows experts, what makes them experts, is the fact that they're so intuitive, the fact that they've trained their emotional brain, all these dopamine neurons, they've embedded them with knowledge through, you know, years and years of practice and learning and practice and learning. That's, that's trained their emotional brain. So, so when it comes time to actually make a decision, when you've actually got the ball in your hands, you don't have to, you know, Think through the you know think through the equations and 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 carefully analyze the field. Your brain does that for you. You can kind of go on autopilot, so to speak, and and trust these subtle feelings that tell you how to find the open man. It feels so corny to say this, but it really is a very much a vindication of the old saws that practice makes perfect, and uh, you learn best from your mistakes, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that really surprised me while writing the book was, you know, the validation of that old cliche you learned from your mistakes. Um, I think when you look at our brain cells, and in particular dopamine neurons, the way they learn, the way they get so good at finding all these patterns in the real world is at something called the prediction error signal, which is they make all these predictions, but then let's say, to get back to the experimental paradigm we were talking about a little earlier, let's say you ring a bell, flash a light, play a song, and then give them a squirt of juice, and you've trained the monkeys on this you know, elaborate pattern, but let's say you ring the bell, flash a light, play the song, but don't give them a squirt of juice. What happens then? And here's where you get what's called the prediction error signal, which the dopamine neuron stop firing, and that's their way of saying something's gone wrong, we don't know what's happened, quick, you know, fix something. Um, and, and it's a very powerful emotional signal, a negative emotional signal, and that's a crucial component of learning, and it's this, this 
the same signal, the prediction error signal, is now being used to program everything from cell phone towers to backgammon software programs to banks of elevators. It turns out to be a very powerful computational tool. And it was first invented, of course, tens of millions of years ago by evolution. But, but what this suggests, I think, is that by highlighting your mistakes, by really focusing on the prediction error signals you've made in everyday life, you can, in a sense, fast forward this process. You can teach your neurons how to learn faster. Uh, my mind's going back to this quote that I believe it was from a chess player in your book that says, he said something like how it's really just a matter to him of aesthetics, looking at the board, seeing what looks good to him and what looks bad, what looks ugly. And I imagine that sentiment translates to a lot of other pursuits, a lot of other professions where the person's very experienced, but probably, I mean, and you can you can tell me if this is correct or not because you've had so many dealings with scientists, but I would imagine in science it very much is a matter of aesthetics for them, whether something is turning out like they want to, whether an experiment is running as they expected, or whether they're getting that prediction error signal. That's really, it's the uh, one of the ultimate examples of that, I would think, because they're literally making predictions. I think so. I think, I think that, you know, that's one of my favorite quotes in the book, too, where it was a backgammon player, and, and, he, and he talks about how he can't quite articulate how he knows what to do. He simply looks at the board, and some moves seem prettier to him than others. And I think that really gets at a fundamental you know, the fundamental nature of expertise, which is that experts really, they often make decisions for reasons they can't quite articulate. They've learned to trust their emotional brain simply because they've taken the time to train it. And I think that's a key component of expertise. Um, that's, and that's, that's why, for example, you know, when athletes choke, when football players choke in the fourth quarter or baseball players choke in the ninth inning, it's because they become so self-conscious that they've lost the ability to simply rely on their emotional brain, to simply you know, rely on their autopilot. Instead, in, instead, they're trying to think too much. They're trying to trust their rational brain, so to speak. Um, and the end result is, is that they perform movements like a beginner. Um, so, so, so a key component of expertise of being a great quarterback, of being a great backgammon player, is learning to trust your instincts, but only after you've taken the time to train them. You know, obviously, I can't go in and be an NFL quarterback. I haven't taken the time to train my brain. I would get sacked every time. I would never find the open man. But once you take the time to train it, and that takes lots and lots of time and lots of hard work and lots of mistakes, there really are no shortcuts, you know, it, it, it's really important to learn to rely on it. It was an extremely fascinating section of how we decide the one that was specifically about choking the phenomenon we were just discussing where you think too much. Everybody knows it because everybody hears it, you know, don't choke, oh, I hope I don't choke up there on stage doing a play or what have you. But what I thought was fascinating is that how it seems to be from your description is that choking is kind of the, it's the normal stage for a beginner. A beginner is in kind of a perpetual choking state and they move out of that as they train their emotional brain. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, a lot of this work's been done by a psychologist named Sean Baylock at uh, Northwestern University. And she's shown, she actually brings people onto a putting green in her lab. Um, so it's a bit more fun than most psychology experiments I've participated in. And what she shows is that when you have a beginner on the putting green, they actually perform better when they're very deliberate, when they really think about their stroke. So, you know, there are all those movements Hitting a golf ball is, you know, some exquisite choreography of movement. And when you're beginning, it really pays off when you focus on, you know, your backstroke and your upstroke and keeping your hips straight and, you know, your wrist taut and all the rest. Then you hit the best shot. However, when you bring in an expert golfer, someone who's already trained their brain how to hit a golf shot, and now you tell them, okay, now think about all these things. Make sure your hips don't swing out. Make sure your wrists are straight, et cetera, et cetera. They end up hitting much worse shots because they become too self-conscious. That's because all these movements, they've already been memorized by their brain. Their brain already knows how to do it. So when they try to overrule their autopilot, in a sense, they end up making bad shots. They end up making consistent mistakes. And, and, and that's why high-pressure situations tend to cause choking, because we become so self-conscious. We're so worried about making a mistake that we start thinking too much. And that, and that takes the action away from the way it should be done, which is by the emotional brain We're, relying on these automatic reflexes, and moves it to a different part of the brain, you know, the rational, deliberate prefrontal cortex, so to speak. Now, this is not a self-help book, but I do wonder, what does the research say about ways to avoid this choking state? Is there any, is there any optimistic development on that front? <laughs> uh, you know, 
everyone, when I talked to uh, Sean Baylock, as she put it, everyone's got to have their own secret mechanism. Some people will be taking deep breaths. Some people, people will be thinking about their girlfriend. Everyone's got their own kind of secret key that will allow them to stop thinking too much. One interesting experiment, which kind of builds on this research, shows that when you have these expert athletes think of what's called a holistic keyword, which is, you know, instead of thinking about your hips or your wrist or a specific detail of your stroke, just focus on a word like smooth or elegant. That ends up helping experts do even better than normal. So that's one way to kind of prevent your brain from going into overdrive, is, is instead of fixating on specific elements of your stroke, have your brain fixate on a generic adjective. Um, and that can help people, it seems, and this is just preliminary evidence, but help people uh, prevent choking. If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio. At colinmarshallradio.com, you'll find our complete show archive, other podcasts, and more. My guest is Jonah Lehrer, editor-at-large from CETA Magazine and author of How We Decide. I'd like to talk a little bit more about, and we mentioned this with Damasio's experiments, about what, or more studies more than experience, experiments, but about what happens when the emotional brain doesn't quite work, when emotions aren't there to provide their service. Now, there's a bit in the book about a man who I believe develops a brain tumor, and thus he can't make any decision at all. Can he? What, what could he actually do without emotions? He, he couldn't do very much. I mean, I mean this, this really ruined his life. Um, this is a patient known as Elliot, and, and before the tumor, he was a, you know, a great success story. He was in a management position at an accounting corporation. Um, he scored very high on IQ scores, on the IQ test, excuse me. Um, he, he, you know, he, he was a very smart, rational man. He was a happy husband, a good father, went to church, you know, just, 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 just a real success story. And then tragically, after this brain tumor, at first glance, it seemed like everything had gone back to normal. Um, he scored well on all the language tests, all the intelligence tests. Um, he seemed to be the same old Elliot. And yet, when you looked a little closer, it became clear that he was way too serene. He was, he was you know, oddly serene. You know, he never seemed scared or nervous or any of these very normal everyday emotions we all experience. And, and, and this got Demacia quite interested in what would happen, you know, when, you know, given a person who couldn't experience emotion. I think he was quite surprised to learn just how debilitating it was. Um, that, that Ellie was not only very, very indecisive, and, and this was debilitating, you know, to a debilitating degree where he would spend all day trying to make a very simple, banal decision, but the few decisions he did make tended to be catastrophic. So he, he lost all his money to a con man. He ended up, you know, leaving his wife. He had to move in with his parents. A very, very sad story. And I think it all speaks to not only the importance of emotions in terms of letting us make any decision, period, but, but the importance of emotions in letting us make the right decisions. You know, I think this, this really was a very influential moment in terms of helping scientists reconceptualize the importance and benefits of the emotional brain. Now, how accurate would it be to say that these patients, the ones who have had their emotional brains impaired, because it seems so surreal to think about, how accurate would it be to say that they have their lives go to shambles, essentially, but they don't seem to care as much as one would expect them to? I mean, you described them as being serene. Do patients like this... I mean, they must mind, but yeah. Well, well, that's a good point, and that is, and that is, I think, one of the, 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 the tragic ironies of of being one of these patients is that even though your life is being destroyed, you can't fully appreciate, you don't fully feel the the you know, the sense of loss that the rest of us would feel. I think I think you can still be very aware in a, you know, in a detached, rational sense of 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 just how much you've lost. But I think when it's not accompanied by that that feel that that feeling of loss, that very negative charge, I think you're less able to act on it. You're less able to you know to 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 change your circumstances, and most importantly, to learn from your mistakes. I think you know a crucial part of the benefits of these negative emotions is that they help us do something different the next time around. So that the next time you don't go into con man, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and so I think you know it's not something that they couldn't appreciate their condition. They they couldn't appreciate how much they'd lost. Um, since since the brain tumors, that Elliot couldn't do anything different the next time around. 
So did it make life, or I know you weren't the scientist to actually do this study, but I feel like uh, I might as well ask the questions while I've got them. With this sort of patient, does does it convert life into essentially what the rest of us would consider to be a random system? Like we wouldn't bother making decisions in randomness because we wouldn't think we could affect anything. I'm 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 not sure Elliot saw the world like a random system. I mean he 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 certainly did make some decisions. Um and you know, I think I think he was struggling. Um, you know, I mean obviously I don't know I'm 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 just relying on conversations and, and reports of, of people like Damasio and Antoine Bashar at the University of Iowa. So 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 I, I, I can't exactly speak to the you know exact nature of Elliot's condition and, and, and how you know and how he thought of himself. But I'm I'm not sure I'd put it that Elliot saw life as inherently random or that he grew very fatalistic. I think, you know, he he was simply he didn't have these emotional signals, which which so often we're not even aware of. You know, when I reach the Honey Nut Cheerios now, it's 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 not that I'm suddenly aware of, wow, I really want Honey Nut Cheerios, or 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 when I get scared, I suddenly notice my clammy you know clammy palm um, and racing pulse. It's these signals are always there; they're always governing how we're thinking. And so, even when we're not aware of them, even when we don't pay attention to them, they still end up influencing our thoughts and actions and decisions. And, and so I think the way to see these patients is is really as a confirmation of just how essential they are, of, of just how essential these emotions are. There's a bit in your book where you describe something very relevant to any modern reader. It's the it's elements of modern life, really. It is inorganic external factors that mess up or mislead the emotional brain, one of them being credit cards. I think that's a fairly good key, how credit cards mess up your emotional brain to how things can misguide it in general. So what happens when someone use a credit, uses a credit card versus when they're using cash as far as inside their dopamine system? Well, this is definitely something that very much surprised me. Um, and, and, and yet I completely understand as a, you know, inveterate credit card user. The best way to understand this is, is, is to backtrack a bit and, and try to understand what happens in your brain whenever you make a shopping decision. And it turns out there's an emotional tug of war. So let's say you're contemplating you know, a new sweater. When you look at the sweater and this brand new cashmere sweater, let's say, a part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is generally associated with things like rewards, things like chocolate cake and, and pleasurable rewards, that gets turned on whenever you contemplate the new thing. You know, you're excited about the prospect of getting something new. You, you imagine how good you would look in it, et cetera, et cetera. So that, so that makes you happy. That's a positive feeling. At the same time, when you look at the price tag, you contemplate the cost of it, and that means giving something up. That means the pain of paying for it. And that triggers activity in the brain area called the insula. Now, the insula is normally associated with things like bodily pain. So when you punch someone in the face, their insula is turned on. It generates all sorts of negative and very aversive feelings. And this makes sense. This is why it doesn't feel good to spend lots of money or to lose our wallet or to simply lose money. We associate money with, you know, good stuff and losing it, having less of it makes us feel bad. So that's this emotional tug of war. It turns out when you put people in a brain scan, you can actually predict which things they'll buy simply based on this pattern of activity. So if the nucleus accumbens is more active than the insula, they tend to buy it. And vice versa, they tend to not buy it. So it's a pretty reliable tug of war, um, and, and whichever side shows more activation actually influences our shopping decisions. Now, what's interesting about credit cards is that because they abstract the transaction, because you're not actually taking cash out of your wallet, you're just, you know, swiping a piece of plastic and the charge will show up on your bill in a month, the insula is less active than normal because it doesn't, it doesn't fully comprehend the actual payment. Um, you know, the, the payment's been abstracted. And so the end result is that people spend too much money. Their nucleus accumbens, the pleasure part of the shopping equation, tends to drive all their shopping decisions. I think this is neatly demonstrated by another experiment I discussed, which, is, which was done by two MIT economists who had people bid, and, bid for Boston Celtics tickets at an auction. Some people were allowed to bid with credit cards, and the rest of the people had to pay with cash. It turned out the people who bid with credit cards ended up bidding twice as much money as the people who had to pay with cash. And I think that's simply because when you pay with credit cards, you're less aware, you're less conscious of the pain of payment. It hurts less to spend money. And so the end result is we spend too much money. This seems to fit into what's become, or what will become, a classic science story sort of a mold where, the, where an article or a piece of research says, 
Our brains detect things a certain way, but modern life has made the setting different enough that they don't quite work right. It reminds me of, and you can tell me how much this kind of phenomenon is related, but it reminds me of how you'll read every so often that people drive riskily or more riskily than they would otherwise because a car does not approach you like a dangerous animal would and the brain's not going to interpret it as something that can kill you as much as a car can because of course a car is more dangerous than an animal in this day and age anyway. I think it's a good example. I think there are all sorts of ways that that modern life, sometimes accidentally, sometimes deliberately, I think, you know, in light of this research, you can see how retail stores are constantly manipulating your brain. Um, not that retail stores know about the succumbents and the insula, but they simply know what gets customers to pay more money, um, to spend more money. So so I think there are all sorts of ways that 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 the modern world tweaks and manipulates the emotional brain to get us to do stuff that we want often without knowing about it, often without knowing why we're doing it. You know, I think there's an interesting uh, study done by by scientists at Williams College and something called mortality salience effect. And what this shows is that when you flash people subliminally, so they're not even aware that they've seen this, it just hits their unconscious brain. When you flash them stuff like WTC or 911, these are coded references to 9-11, it turns out that even though the people aren't aware they've seen these figures um, and, and numbers, that they become more conservative when you ask them political questions. So when this study was done in 2004, if you flash people WTC or 911 and then ask them whether or not they were in favor of the Iraq war or how they felt about George Bush's foreign policy, they became much more supportive when they'd been primed with this, with this mortality sentence condition, when they'd been flashed 911. I think that just gives us, you know, perhaps a worrisome um, clue as to how many of our decisions are actually motivated by things beyond our control, by, by, by kind of loopholes, so to speak, in the emotional brain. And, and by playing with these loopholes, by playing with these flaws like the insulin credit card or, or the way the brain perceives risk and, 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 you know, how that makes us drive the wrong way, um, I think you can really, I think, begin to begin to prevent these mistakes from occurring. I think the first, the, the first step is to identify them and to figure out what triggers them. And, and hopefully that will lead people to, you know, cut up their credit cards or put them in a block of ice in the freezer. Um, <laughs> stuff like that. Speaking of these framing effects, I was happy to see you linked up to, well, it's not, it's not the web. I, you referenced a piece of research in your book that I had seen an article on about, oh, a year and a half ago or so. But it's the one where... It was describing how when a kid is told that they have succeeded on something, a test, let's say, because they worked hard versus they succeeded on it because they are intrinsically smart, the ones that say they did it because they worked hard then worked harder. The ones that were told they were smart were just fighting to preserve the smart status and didn't continue challenging themselves. What's going on in there in this whole line of what's, what's getting rewarded here? This is work done by Carol Dweck at Stanford University, and I think this is very, very interesting work. And she shows that simply altering a single line of praise you give to a second grader, so either praising them for their smart, their innate intelligence, or praising them for their effort, you know, for how hard they work, can actually have very, very widespread implications down the road. Kids who are praised for being smart, they tend to fear making mistakes. So, so, so they want to preserve their image of being smart, which, which, which means they're less likely to take the hard tests, which they may make lots of mistakes on. Um, in, instead, they want to take the easy test so they can preserve this self-image. In contrast, kids who are praised for effort are much more likely to take the hard tests, which, which because of what we talked about earlier in terms of how the brain learns best by setting its mistakes, can actually lead them to learn better and, and do better down the road. Um, they want to take the hard test so then, then they can see what they got wrong and try to get it right the next time around. That is the best way to learn. And, and so simply changing a single line of praise, whether or not you praise kids for being smart or for working hard, can actually have really big impacts in terms of how the kids do on tests and how they approach challenges. What you want is you want to, I think, inculcate in your child a sense of being willing to embrace tough stuff, being willing to make a mistake, to not, you know, to not fear the possibility of getting something wrong because that is how you learn. You know, we all make mistakes. The question is what happens next? Do we simply, you know, recoil from the mistake or do we try to learn from it? And I think what you want to teach a, a, a young student 
is, is the benefits of really learning from your errors, challenging yourself and then learning from your mistakes. And I think her work is a very powerful confirmation of that. This brings up again another piece of old wisdom that's now at least more vindicated by scientific findings. I believe a Herbert Spencer quotes something like, the ultimate effects of shielding man from folly is to populate the world with fools. Is that, is that something borne out with research like this? That, that's a great quote. I, I wish I'd put that in the book. <laughs> well, maybe when it uh, comes out in paperback. Yeah, or... exactly. <laughs> I wanted to move a little bit on to some of the issues of morality you bring up, because morality is so much... So much uh, an issue of itself of evaluating someone's decision making and labeling it as moral or immoral. What are the what are the more prominent moral implications of the kind of research you deal with in this book? What does it say about the way we think about morality? I look at morality as the prism of decision making because when you boil morality down, it really is a series of decisions as to how we treat other people. And and I think the old assumption of of many biologists and scientists was that people were Hobbesian brutes, that we'd kind of been programmed to be selfish, you know, we're stuffed full of these selfish genes, and, and we only looked out for ourselves, and that's why, you know, occasionally we'd be altruistic, but that was really just a Band-Aid over, you know, our, our, our kind of bad interior, said that when it came down to it, we were these bad, selfish, biological brutes. And I think what you actually find, and this is pretty new research really in the last couple of years, is that that's not the case at all. The people are actually endowed with a very powerful set of social and moral instincts. That looking at someone else in pain or looking at someone else who's scared makes us scared. To hurt someone else is to hurt ourselves. That, that when you put someone in a brain scanner and you show them faces of people in pain, their brain lights up as if they were in pain. This, this is a very basic hardwired sense of sympathy. And I think this gets back to the fact that we're social primates. You know, we had to learn how to live in a group. And the way we learned to live in a group is we developed all these mechanisms that keep us from hurting each other. And, and I think it's these moral emotions that, that play a crucial role in, in, in guiding our moral decisions. How much can be done, I suppose I should say, as far as if somebody is truly amoral or immoral, I would imagine that research like this blames a lot of that on, I don't know, blames is the word, but takes a lot of it as a purely biological matter. You know, someone might have a brain tumor. So what, what do you think are the implications for society discouraging what we would call immoral acts and encouraging what we'd call moral ones if the root could actually be an organic structure? Well, well I, think, I think the root is almost certainly an organic structure in the brain. I mean, I don't know where else it would occur if it didn't occur in the brain. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure the implications for how this science should should alter things like the legal system or the way we conceive of morality more generally. I, I'm not quite sure the research is far along enough yet for, for us to really talk about those implications. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about, in, in the book, about psychopaths, and I think a lot of the research has been done in terms of what makes psychopaths psychopaths. And, and what you see in their brains is you see an actual defect, many scientists believe it has to do with the amygdala, that makes them less sensitive to the emotions of others. So, so if I see someone in pain, my brain lights up as if, as if I were in pain. I naturally sympathize, empathize with their struggle, with their strife, with, with the feelings they're feeling. Psychopaths don't do that. So, so they don't have this automatic activation triggered by the emotions of someone else. And I think that makes them much more likely to be willing to hurt someone else because they don't get hurt by, by seeing someone else in pain. So, so the question then, of course, for, for the legal system, for instance, is, well, then, should we punish them? It seems kind of unfair to punish someone for a brain defect. Um, but but the, these are very, very complicated questions, um, way beyond my pay grade. Um, and and, I'm, I'm, and, I, and I, I'm, not quite clear, I'm not quite sure the neuroscience is really there yet where, where, where it should really be shaping the way our legal system works. Um, I think... That's an awful lot to ask of a brain scanning experiment. Even beyond the legal system, though, there, there does seem to be maybe a light, in a, a light at the end of the tunnel is a little much, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence that suggests that these sorts of things, you know, what makes a serial killer a serial killer or a sociopath of any kind a sociopath of any kind, there's no evidence that suggests these things are not or that will never be correctable, right? You know, this, 
this is, I think, there's there's been very little uh, evidence that it, that it, that it's possible to correct for this. That 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 once a psychopath is made, and there's certainly a genetic component to psychopathy, um, but there also seems to be a big nurture component. And so, what a lot of research has suggested is that kids who are abused, when they're denied the emotional warmth we all are trained to expect that we all need, that literally warps the brain and, and hurts the brain and harms the brain. And, and that seems to be a, a significant uh, trigger for, for making a psychopath. There's very little evidence that you can train people to sympathize with others at this very basic, profound level. I mean, we're not talking about just learning how to think nice thoughts. We're talking about learning how to feel a very visceral um, emotion and, and, and feeling in response to seeing other people in pain. I think that's 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 not something um, that at least now we know how to train. I think that's something that that takes place outside the bounds of of cognition we can control. It'd be a matter then of having to install an entirely new brain, and at that point, you know, you might as well be focusing on another person entirely. Yeah, I I I think that's some of the bleak implications of this research. There's a metaphor for the brain that I really like, and it's given a prominent place in the book, so I'd imagine you like it too. Is the brain is an argument now? What are the specifics to that? It's an argument between what, what, and what else. Well, well, it it can be an argument between many different things. As we saw with with shopping, for example, trying to figure out how to buy that sweater. In that case, the argument taking place is between the part of your brain that wants the sweater, that wants the pleasure of getting something new, and the part of your brain that doesn't want to spend money. So that's a clear example of of one of these cortical arguments taking place between different brain areas that are activated and triggered by different parts of the real world. And so they, generate into, they, they each generate a different set of emotions to correspond with what they're responding to. And so the key then is to kind of try to eavesdrop on this argument, to try to listen to all the different brain areas and make an informed decision based on what these emotions are telling you, based on what these different emotional brain areas are telling you. So, so you know, Maybe you should buy the sweater, or maybe you've already got a lot of credit card debt, in which case you, know, you should listen to the insula. So not to simply block out these emotions, um, not to simply ignore parts of your brain. That can lead to all sorts of bad decisions, but to really try to pay attention to them so that you can make a better and more informed decision. With what you've learned in the research of how we decide then, how do you approach, say, the cereal aisle <laughs> differently these days? With great trepidation. Um, I, you know, I... To be perfectly honest, I'm still a very flawed decision maker. I still probably take a few minutes too long uh, choosing 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 a box of Cheerios. But I have learned in that case, I, I've really tried to become more sensitive, given what I've read about the research, to my emotional brain in that situation. There are other contexts in which I've learned to really tune out my emotional brain. You know, I no longer evaluate my stock portfolio um, with any sort of my emotional brain. I've I've learned that's not the way to do it. But but in the cereal aisle. I really try to pay attention to what I actually want. You know, what my emotional brain is trying to tell me. Do I really want Honey Nut Cheerios? Or maybe this week I'm in the mood for multigrain Cheerios. So, so that's a case of I've tried to become a more sensitive listener. Um, and, and the end result is, I think, a, a slightly better tasting uh, breakfast in the morning. <laughs> now, this book followed fairly closely on Proust Was a Neuroscientist, your previous book. I imagine that you had already started How We Decide, although correct me if I'm wrong, while you were still in the at least end stages of promoting Proust, are you already at work on something else? Um, well, well, Proust was funny because it ended up, it, I had about nine months after I was done with Proust before it came out for uh, all, all sorts of boring corporate reasons. Um, so, 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 that, so that really was when I first started thinking about breakfast cereal, I hate to admit. Right now I am beginning to think about a, a, a third book, but uh, my thoughts are far too scattered and incomplete to... Uh, to, to share on the radio, unfortunately, but 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 I am beginning to think about about the next book. I would imagine that, considering the, I mean, you work for Seed, you have quite a few scientific, you have a, a large scientific Rolodex at your fingertips. It must be a similarly difficult decision choosing which scientific topic to take on next, as it is choosing, say, a breakfast cereal. You know what? That's an interesting question. It's actually uh, it's actually a little bit easier for me. Um, I actually agonize more over Cheerios than 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 book topics. That 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 is an embarrassing admission. But I think for me, when I find a topic, it's one of those things where as soon as I come up with it, I know it. You know, as 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 soon as I 
you know, it just, I, I really did have that epiphany in the cereal aisle where I was like, wow, I really should study decision making. I really want to learn more about this. It just struck me as a really novel and interesting problem that I'd, that I'd love to spend two years learning about. And, and so I'm not quite there with, with book number three, but, but I can feel that, that, that at this point, slightly familiar tug of curiosity. It's one of those gut feelings that once you get it, you know, you know you've got it. There's, there's, there's no rationalizing it away. So could we put it like this? You were standing in the grocery aisle trying to buy your breakfast cereal. Your emotional brain was not giving you a cue to decide which cereal. But, but <laughs> then, it, then it, gave you, it gave you a strong cue. You know, when you started thinking about the actual science of decision-making, it said, yeah, do more of that. That, that's a great way to look at it. So I really owe Cheerios a lot. <laughs> the book, once again, is How We Decide. Jonah, thanks so much for coming back on the program. Thanks so much for having me. Our music is produced by Ben Althouse. Check out more of his work at benalthouse.com. And for our complete interview archive, other podcasts, and more, visit colinmarshallradio.com.